and welcome to Engage and Empower Me, a patient engagement design course here at Stanford Medical School. I'm Dr. Kyra Bobinet from the Persuasive Tech Lab. And with me, I have a co-director, uh, Dr. Larry Chu, who's the executive director of Medicine X at Stanford, as well as an associate professor of anesthesia. And we are really happy to have you here uh, for this wonderful class. We're gonna start with our e-patient moderator, Alicia Staley, who is uh, one of our MedX e-patient leaders. Uh, she's a three-time cancer survivor and has studied engineering at uh, Syracuse University, graduated from Boston University with an MBA and MS degree, and she lives in Boston, Massachusetts. So please welcome Alicia Staley. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Good evening, my name is Alicia Staley, um, and I'm here to talk tonight about uh, what engagement and empowerment means to me um, as an e-patient. So I'm gonna give you the patient perspective before we actually have the uh, neuroscience perspective. So anybody know this famous photo, Earthrise? So when I was a little kid, my dream was to be an astronaut. Um, it was everything I did, I had telescope, wanted to go to the moon, those were my goals. I went off to Syracuse University to start studying engineering, and unfortunately, I was diagnosed with cancer within the first 18 months while I was at school. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, that was my education. That was my experience, unfortunately. I had st stage 2A Hodgkin's disease, and I was a, a case study in isolation. Network of one at Syracuse University. Welcome to nowhere. I was by myself very isolating experience. I had no idea what patient empowerment or patient engagement could be mean for me. On April Fool's Day in 2004, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So happy April Fool's Day to me. Not a good way to spend the holiday. Here's some of my medical imaging um, that they were taking at that point. Again, I felt like I was on a road to nowhere. A very isolating case for me. It was very, very hard. Uh, to continue on my journey at school and chase my dreams of being an aerospace engineer. In 2008, something radical happened. I joined Twitter. <laughs> so follow me, please. At Stales, tweet me at Stales. Um, and my, my world just exploded. My network of one, an isolating case of a, a Hodgkin's and breast cancer survivor, my life changed. I began falling into all these different digital connections and making, just meeting cancer survivor after cancer survivor. This to me was engagement. This to me was empowerment. Many, 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 many years later. I found the statistic from WeGo Health a few weeks ago. 85% of patients agree that social media plays some role in their healthcare decisions. And for me, that was a light bulb moment. Absolute light bulb moment. That's when I realized what empowerment was. That's when I realized what engagement was. Patients want to help each other. It's pretty simple. I've fallen and I can't get up. That's basically what cancer survivors are saying on Twitter. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Can you help me? Through Twitter, through Facebook, through LinkedIn, I started learning about people like ePatient Dave, Trisha Tori. My cancer network began exploding and I learned about something called the obligation of the cured. Google it. Lance Armstrong said it. Obligation of the cured for me meant starting a tweet chat called BCSM, Breast Cancer Social Media. So while you're all tweeting tonight with the MedX hashtag, I encourage you to go check out the BCSM hashtag at some point. This is my BCSM team. Myself, Jody Sugar, and Deanna Atai. We are the three co-moderators of this Twitter chat that's been running continuously now since July of 2011. Here's a face, that, here's a quick snapshot of all the people that have ever tweeted into this hashtag. This is just a small sampling of the cancer survivors, breast cancer survivors, doctors, nurses, companies that are engaging with us on Twitter about breast cancer. This is what our, our network nodes look like. This is the BCSM network analyzed by Keywords, breast, lesions, uh, cancer, pain meds. We're having these conversations online. That's engagement, that's empowerment to me. 
Again, here's some, a, a snapshot of the statistics. 235 million Twitter impressions since we started in July 2011. Here's just a, a sampling of some of these things that we see from Storify. We introduce ourselves. We talk about what's going on. The day after I was diagnosed, my best friend brought me a journal. We're helping each other online. That's patient empowerment. That's patient engagement. And I guess, wow, that was the fastest five minutes of my life. <laughs> um, but I encourage you to tweet me if you'd like to learn more about how social media and patient engagement has really changed my life. So thank you very much. <laughs> wow, that's really fast five minutes. It's very good. <laughs> OK, so um, next up, now that I've talked a little bit about from the patient perspective, what engagement and empowerment means. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Eagleman, who's a neuroscientist and New York Times bestselling author. He directs the Initiative on Neuroscience and Law at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. Dr. Eagleman is a highly sought after speaker, appearing in the New Yorker, the Atlantic, TED Talks, and the Colbert Report. <laughs> and please join me in welcoming Dr. Eagleman. Thank you so much, yeah. Alicia. Thank you. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is, in terms of patient engagement is why do people sometimes not engage? What is the reason that we often don't do what we know we should be doing? Um, and so I want to take that from a neuroscience perspective tonight. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and, of course, we're all familiar with the situation, not only in terms of patient engagement, but in terms of our own lives, right, which is we're faced all the time with things that, we, foods we know that we shouldn't eat and things that we know we should be doing uh, in our diets or things like getting screenings and so on. And so um, what's the reason that for almost all of us, we just don't do that enough? So for example, uh, how many of you made New Year's resolutions by show of hands? How many made? OK, so how many kept them through the first week of January? All right, how many through the second week? How many through the third week? OK, your hand's dropping. Um, <laughs> OK, so the question is why. Now, when I'm thinking about this from the point of view of the healthcare system, um, uh, one possibility is maybe there's just not enough information out there. Maybe the issue is that people want to do things to engage with their health, but they can't find it. And it turns out that's not the answer. It turns out the government, for example, has put a lot of time and resource into making sure that the information is there and everybody can get it. Um, and in fact, you know, if you want to quit smoking, there's all, these, all these government organizations, a lot of taxpayer dollar going in that. But you know what? It's just, it, it doesn't always work because it's really difficult, right? So if you know somebody who's an addict of any sort, you'll know that it's not as easy as going to the government website and looking up the information that you need. Okay, so this is what I'm going to address is why is it so difficult? So this is what I study every day in the lab. Um, it's about three pounds and it contains everything that you are, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your decision making, your risk aversion, your temptations, all of that is contained in this. And um, some of you who I know who have seen me speak before uh, have heard me say that it's the most complicated device in the entire universe. We've never found anything quite like this. And just for a super quick background, for those of you who don't know, the, the human brain is made up of tens of billions of neurons. These are the specialized cell type in the brain. Every single neuron is as complicated as the city of San Francisco. It's got the entire human genome and it. it's trafficking millions of proteins around. Each one of these is connected to about 10,000 others. So we're talking hundreds of trillions of connections, which means that if you just took a, a, a cubic centimeter of brain tissue, there are as many connections in there as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a really complicated system we're talking about, and this is somehow what's underlying all your decision making about whether you eat that ice cream or whether you go for the broccoli. Okay. So the thing that got me interested and the thing I wrote my last book about was this issue that we're talking about the, you know, this incredibly complex system. One of the most significant intellectual developments that our species has had is realizing that somehow all of that wet biological gushy stuff is you. And how do we know this? Well, um, you know, let's say you thought maybe you and your decision making and so on is contained in, in your pinky. Well, if you were to damage uh, part of your pinky in a car accident, you'd be sad about it. You'd be, but you'd be no different as a person. But if you damage an equivalently sized chunk of brain tissue, 
That changes you entirely. That changes the kind of decisions you make. And that's how we know that all of that decision making is happening here. Now the part that's so interesting to me is that almost all of it runs under the hood of conscious awareness. So most of what you act and do and think and believe happens at levels that you have no acquaintance with and, and you're not aware of. So when I talk about consciousness, by the way, I, I'm talking about that part of you that flickers to life when you wake up in the morning. That's, going, that's consciousness, but it turns out that most of what the brain is doing is not at that level. It's running below that radar. And that's what has led people to talk about this idea of the, the unconscious or the subconscious. And it turns out that the conscious brain is like a broom closet in the mansion of the brain in terms of the amount of, uh, in terms of, the amount of control that it has. And um, you know, one of the analogies that I, uh, that I use is that the conscious mind is like a stowaway on a transatlantic steamship that's taking credit for the whole journey without acknowledging all the engineering that's underfoot. So when we're asking this question about why don't we do what we know we should, this is, this is the foundation that we're going to build tonight, is understanding what's happening down here. Um, as, as Carl Jung said, in each of us there is another whom we do not know. And as Pink Floyd said, there's someone in my head, but it's not me. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a, a couple very quick examples just to illustrate this point about the unconscious brain and the decision making. So, um, there was a study done some years ago where men were shown pictures of women's faces and photographs and they were asked to rate the attractiveness of the women's faces and uh, on a scale from one to ten. And so what the men didn't know is that in half the photographs it was actually the same women but their eyes had been dilated with some eye drops. And it turns out that um, uniformly the men judged the women with the dilated eyes to be more attractive. Okay, well none of the men noticed, oh her her pupil was a millimeter larger over here. Uh, none of them noticed that and they explicitly said that, but presumably the important part is that none of the men were consciously aware that dilated eyes is a biological sign of sexual readiness in women. But their brains knew it, and it steered them towards the right sort of behavior, and they were making the right sorts of decisions without even being aware of what was driving them towards that. And I just use this as one of hundreds of examples to illustrate how much our behavior is driven around by things that we don't, that we don't know of. Here's another quick example. If you're holding a, a warm mug of tea, you'll describe your relationship with your mother as being closer than if you're holding an iced tea. And again, it's an unconscious influence, and we would hate to think that somehow our, our belief about our relationship with our mother is, is steered, is, is modulated by these other unconscious processes but, but they are. Everything in our life is. Okay, so this is all to say there's an enormous gap between what your mind has access to and what's actually happening in your brain. There's a lot happening down there that's driving you around. Why is there this gap? Fundamentally, there has to be because there's too much happening down here. It would be like if you, um, you know, if you wanted to understand everything that was happening in America right now, there's just too much happening. I mean, everybody's making decisions. People are driving. There's cops chasing criminals, there's people answering phones, there's you know, stuff happening everywhere. You don't want to know that. You couldn't handle that type of information. Instead, what you do is you pick up a newspaper. And you just get the top level headline. And that's what the conscious mind is. It's just giving you the top level headlines about what's going on. And so what you want, I mean, that's what the conscious mind is about. It's just giving you some sort of summary of what's happening in this very enormous system below you. And so what we're going to explore is, why, what's going on down there, and what is it that steers you towards the wrong sorts of behaviors? And finally, we're going to explore what you can do as an individual, and also for those involved in healthcare who want to understand um, how they can uh, engage their patients to a different level, what one can do given this knowledge. Okay, actually, I'm just going to give you one more example um, uh, about the things that your brain knows how to do that you don't even have access to. So, it's like everyone to put their hands on their steering wheel. Okay, so everyone put your hands on the steering wheel. You're going up uh, 280, and I want you to make a left lane change. So go ahead and make a, a change in your left lane. <laughs> okay. Okay. I only saw one person use his blinker. That was very good. Um, I only saw, it wasn't easy to see everyone, but almost everyone did it wrong. Um, which is to say, everyone I saw uh, turned to the left and then back to the center. So that would drive you off the road. You've just crashed. The way you make a lane change is you go to the left, back to center, all the way just as far to the other side, and then back to the center again. That's what a lane change looks like. And you do it every single day, and you don't even know what you're doing. 
So this is an example of the kind of, uh, the, the kind of lack of knowledge you have about what you're doing and how you make your decisions. OK, so um, bottom line of this is that cognition is essentially running under the hood. It's running incognito. But this is the thing that drives decision making. It's the unconscious brain. So when you decide, all right, look, I know I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to get this cancer screening. I'm supposed to eat vegetables and so on. This is the thing that's steering the boat. So um, this has become an area of interest both for neuroscientists and, and before that, even for economists. Um, and so I'm just curious, how many people have heard of behavioral economics or neuroeconomics? Okay, about a third, a third people. Okay, so these are fields which are asking the question of how do people actually make decisions rather than assuming that people are rational decision makers and, and act in a, in a way that's most suitable and rational for them to move forward. So just as an example, uh, in, in classic economics, you have this mythical homo economicus, which, which um, you know, is rational, maximizes gain, minimizes his loss, can delay gratification, is objective, unswayed by feeling, behaves consistently, and so on. This is the model for essentially all economic theory up until uh, really a decade or two decades ago. And so the idea is this, if you give some question to homo economicus, like, well, would you rather have three cans of this soda for a dollar or four cans of this soda for a dollar fifty? It's easy. It's just a math problem for him. But it's not that way for real humans, because as soon as you add branding to this, then it changes. It changes people's decision making, right? Cultural messaging, branding, all these things influence our, our behavior. And so homo sapiens is something more like this. We're, we're irrational, we care about immediate <coughs> gratification, we ignore consequences, we're swayed by emotion, we behave inconsistently, we're confused by risk, we're influenced by branding. This is the creature that we're actually dealing with. So when we talk about patient engagement and asking people and ourselves to do the right thing, this is really what's happening on the ground here. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, describe a, a framework uh, for how I think about the brain. And essentially, it's very simple. It's just this issue here, which is that you are not one thing. Instead, there's, there's sort of a, a multiplicity of views. And what I mean by that is the brain isn't some sort of simple algorithm that's just um, doing the homo economicus uh, run through of, of the consequences and, and gain and loss. Instead, what, what the brain's made up of are multiple networks that are all competing to steer the ship of state. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. But you have this competition that's happening under the hood of all these different drives that all want to be in control. So the right way to think about the brain is not as a single thing, but instead something like a neural parliament, where you've got all these political parties that are fighting it out. And so exactly the same way that our political system has Democrats and Republicans and independents and libertarians, all these people love their country. They just have different ways of going about things. And that's exactly what's going on in the brain, too. So, for example, if I were to put some warm chocolate chip cookies in front of you, part of your brain wants that because it's a rich energy source. Part of your brain says, don't eat it, you're going to get fat. And you can argue with yourself, and you can cuss at yourself, and cajole yourself, and get angry at yourself. Who's talking to whom here? It's all you, right? But it's different parts of you. And that's the key, is that fundamentally what's happening under the hood here is like a team of rivals. And so what's happened in modern neuroscience is that we have ways now of peeking under the hood, non-invasively, of eavesdropping on brain activity. So this is the kind of thing we can see in MRI, where we put people in the scanner, we ask them to make decisions about things and, and think about consequences or temptations. And we can measure using something called fMRI, where F stands for fancy, no, it stands for functional. <laughs> we can measure what's happening in terms of the activity in their brain. And so I'm just going to give you the bottom line of sort of 12 years of study on this from, from labs all over the, the world, which is that through different sorts of studies, we can tease out these different competing political parties in the brain. And the right way to think about any sort of decision is it's a function of, of conflict going on. Essentially, you've got all these networks that are battling it out. And I'll show you a few of these in a minute, but it's not worth diving into the details. But this is the, the high-level lesson that's come out of neurobiology is that it's really this, this team of rivals phenomenon. And so the question we're going to ask is, once we understand that, how can we help people manipulate that and change the balance, change what the final vote turns out to be of the parliament? OK, so um, 
Let me give you an example of something that was, uh, uh, this is a cognitive experiment run by Kahneman and Tversky some years ago. So they asked people, and I want to ask you guys this, if I offered you $100 right now, or I offered you $110 in one week, who's going to take the $100 right now? And who's going to take the $110 in a week? Okay. Okay, now let me change the game. Totally different game. I'm going to offer you $100 a year from now, or I'm going to offer you $110 in a year and a week from now. So who's going to take the $100 in a year from now? And who's going to take the $110 53 weeks from now? Okay, <laughs> okay. perfect. Because what I want you to notice is it's the same thing. What I'm asking you is, are you willing to wait a week for 10 more bucks? And in the first case, most of you were not willing to wait a week. And in the second case, every person in the room was willing to wait one extra week for 10 more dollars for a 10% increase. It's the same seven days. Okay, so the question is, why? Why does everyone have this preference reversal over here? And the answer is, we care more about things that are right in front of us. And things that are in the future, we care less about. Now, economists describe this as what's called delayed discounting, which is to say, the farther in the future we're thinking, the less we care about something. It means less to us. And there are lots of experiments uh, showing this sort of thing and, and measuring this. Things that are obscured in the midst of the future just have less value to us. And there's a lot of seduction of the now, of things that are right in front of us. OK, and so um, some of my colleagues, including Sam McClure, and John Cohen and many others have put people in the scanner and given them these sorts of tests where they're offering uh, you know, uh, some sort of temptation. And they're saying, hey, do you want a small reward now or do you want a large reward later? So in this case, you, know, you can eat this delicious cookie now or you cannot eat the cookie and be fit and trim and healthy later. And, and it turns out that you can tease apart and measure the networks in the brain that are involved in short-term decision making and in long-term decision making. And not surprisingly, those that care about small rewards sooner are, are very powerful. These steer our behavior uh, in an extraordinarily uh, powerful way. So one example of this is what happened with the subprime mortgage meltdown. So about 2005, 2006, 80% of the mortgages in this country were subprime. And uh, what happened is you know, people's interest rates went up. They couldn't pay it. Delinquency soared credit tightened, the whole economy melted down as a result of this. But from my lens as a neuroscientist, I see this as a neural phenomenon. It's not an economics phenomenon, it's a neural phenomenon. Why? Because the key about these subprime mortgages is they plugged straight into these I want it now circuits. So you offer somebody you say, hey, here's keys to the house, bigger than you thought you could afford, impress your friends and family, you can have this right now. Yeah, the interest rates are gonna go up at some point. But that's a long way off. That's obscured in the midst of the future. And what happens is it plugs right into these circuits where people want it now. And, and that simple fact can you know, have huge consequences on the economy. Now, this is at a group level. But what I want to talk about is what happens at the individual level. And it's easy to find lots of examples when you start looking around for I want it now versus consequences later. These are all around us. So for example, take things like anabolic steroids with athletes. Um, you know, they know about the risks involved in this, including, you know, losing titles and so on, and yet people still will do this because it's right there in front of them and it's so, it's so uh, uh, tempting. Um, and, you know, recently I met a guy uh, who I thought this was interesting. He, he sold his body um, when he dies for 500 bucks right now. He gets a tattoo on his ankle such that when he dies, the tattoo says where uh, to go for the hospital. And I think that's great. There's nothing wrong with donating your body. I think it's a great idea. But what struck me is that's a really, that's a really sweet deal for a college student. Because $500 right now for something that's you know, infinitely, I mean, it's hard to even conceive of your own death, right? And so I was thinking about that issue. And I thought, you know, it's interesting that we have a term in our language for this. It's built into our mythology. And that's the idea of the deal with the devil. Right? And the reason this is a, a myth that's so powerful is because of this idea of getting something right now and you know there will be consequences later, but there's this delayed discounting such that you don't really care about them. Um, one, one thing that I find fascinating about this, once we understand this sort of temptation of now, is how you manage that. And a story that I found some years ago was the birth of the Christmas Club, which I thought was so interesting. There was a, in Philadelphia in 1909, there was this banker who was thinking about how he was going to keep his bank afloat. And so he came up with this idea. He thought, what if I could get people 
to give me their money all year, and I get to you know, invest it and get interest on it and so on, and they can't take their money back, and if they try to take their money back, I charge them, and would it work? And so he, he started the Christmas club, and the idea was give, give me your money now, and any economist could tell you that it's a terrible idea for the customers to give up their money, right? Because they could get interest in other places and invest in emerging opportunities and have that capital. But instead, they give it up all year um, just so that, um, you know, without any, with, with low interest and, and penalties. OK, well, the answer is obvious why people do this, though, in this context, which is they want somebody to protect them from themselves. And what happened in 1909 is that this blew up. So this guy, Merkel Landis, this banker, proposed it. And he thought, is this going to work? And immediately, everyone started socking away money. And it really worked well. And what it indicated was that for many people, it doesn't actually make sense to follow the economist's advice about holding on your own money. Because some people were smart enough to realize that it was better to give somebody else the responsibility so that you do the right thing. So that your January self you know, does the right thing so that your December self has some money to buy gifts for the, for the children. And of course, this sort of thing uh, people do all over. The I happen to uh, have recently talked to a lot of people who, who do this with the IRS, where they'll claim more deductions on their paycheck so that the IRS holds on to their money all year. And at the end of the year, they get a check back. And they feel great, like they got this refund. But it's their money. It's not the government giving them money. What they're doing, though, in some cases, is smart, because they're making the IRS Hold on to their money so that they won't blow it. Because for a lot of people, if they have extra cash, it burns a hole in their pocket. And so this is a very smart way of doing it. Now, what's the framework how we can understand this sort of thing of managing temptations? Well, for that, let's step back 3,000 years to the, uh, the, the hero of the Trojan War and the king of Ithaca, um, Ulysses who you guys probably remember the story. He's sailing back from the Trojan War, trying to get home after 20 years. And he realizes that they've got this unique opportunity, which is that they're going to pass the island of the Sirens, where you've got these women who sing songs so beautiful that it beggars the human imagination. And, uh, and sailors are so drawn to it, they crash into the rocks and die. So Ulysses knew that he was as susceptible to this as any mortal man, but he really wanted to hear the Sirens' song. So you remember the story. He puts beeswax in all his men's ears so they can't hear. They can keep rowing. And he has them lash him to the mast so that, so that he gets to hear it, but he can't do anything about it. And he tells his men, no matter what I do, keep rowing. What's happening here is the Ulysses of present sound mind is constraining the behavior of the future Ulysses. He is making a, a contract through time so that the, the, the future Ulysses, who will be faced with temptation, won't be able to do anything about it. And so this is called a Ulysses contract. When people make a deal with their future self to constrain their behavior, to fence in their future behavior, that's what's known as a Ulysses contract. And it turns out, this is, I, I say, the key to patient engagement in their own health care. So when we're faced with the thing about the cookies, um, you know, you can say, I want it now, I want it later, but it gets really interesting when people start making contracts with themselves, including things like, you know, if I eat this now, then I'll go to the gym tomorrow, or I'll tell my spouse, you know, I'll be breaking a contract with my spouse, which I made, that I won't eat those cookies. People can set up Ulysses contracts with themselves in order to navigate their behavior. And my, my suggestion tonight is that this is absolutely critical for people to, to implement this sort of thing in their lives and in their health care. And of course, we all know this because I asked at the beginning how many people made New Year's resolutions. Everybody makes New Year's resolutions. And at times all around the year. And if everybody followed through with these things, everybody would be in great shape and everything would be perfect in their lives. But in fact, having good intention is not sufficient. You have to have more than that. You have to put, while you're in a moment of sober reflection, you have to put structures into place so that you'll follow through with that. OK, so I'll give some examples. I'm going to give five ways that, that all of us can structure things in our lives so that we actually follow through with the resolutions that we want. So the first, the first real key thing to do is to minimize temptation. That's the easy one. So for example, with uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing you learn is get rid of all the alcohol in your house. 
Because if you have alcohol in the cabinets, then on a festive Friday night or on a lonely Sunday night or something like that, you're going to drink it. So the first thing in AAA, you get, um, double A, sorry, you get rid of all the alcohol. Okay. And, and of course, it's the same with smokers. You, you set up a contract with yourself that you're not going to hang out with other smokers because if you're hanging out with them, you're going to smoke. And, and one of the things in drug rehab programs is um, never carry more than $20 in your pocket. And don't go down certain streets where you know there will be drug dealers. Why? This is a, a Ulysses contract because you know that if you find yourself in that situation, you're going to behave badly. You're going to crash the ship into the rocks. So the idea is you try to structure things in advance when you're not craving to say, okay, I'm going to make sure I don't have the capacity to do that. Um, I recently saw in some architectural magazine these, these uh, refrigerators with glass doors. It's a horrible idea, right? Because you're going to have a piece of chocolate cake sitting in there, and it's going to be staring at you all day. That's a bad Ulysses contract, OK? The good kind is to have an opaque refrigerator door, like most of us do. It minimizes temptations. Um, uh, probably everybody knows the story about the marshmallow test. You put children in a room, you tell them to uh, you know, resist eating the marshmallow. They'll get more reward later if they resist eating the marshmallow. And then the kids are followed up later. But the point I want to draw about that story is, the children who were really good at resisting, it's not, it's not necessarily that they had better internal impulse control. It's that if you actually watch the videos of it, the children who resisted eating the marshmallow when the adult wasn't in the room were kids who figured out how to minimize the temptation, for example, by clapping their hands over their eyes. So they weren't looking at it. Or other kids took the chair, they turned it around, so they're facing the wall. It's really smart. So these are all ways of minimizing temptation. Okay, so that's number one when you want to structure Ulysses' contract in your life. Minimize temptation. Number two is put money on the line, because money stings, right, when you lose it. Okay, so um, there are some examples. This is a picture from a gym in Denmark where um, the gym membership is free if you show up to the gym at least one, once a week and, and work out. Well, that's really smart, and that's wonderful. And there are several health insurance companies that are doing similar things where they you know, give reductions in insurance if you're following certain steps. So that's useful, but not all gyms, not all insurance companies are going to do that for you. So there are ways that you have to figure that out for yourself. So for example, you know, one of the things to get really uh, um, embedded in our minds is the cost of not going to the gym. Um, so you, know, you spend money on membership and shoes and equipment, and, and, and I encourage people to get a personal trainer because it costs money. And once you've got that money on the line, then it really sucks if you don't show up. So these are ways. So having money on the line, you're really getting people present to the financial costs of not doing what they're supposed to do, what they know uh, they, they should do, is one way to go. Some of you may be familiar with this site called Stick, um, and it's a really great idea. So let's say you want to you put any goal you want there. So I want to lose 20 pounds by uh, you know, April. So you go and you use your credit card and you put 500 bucks on the line. So they actually take $500 from you at that moment when you set the goal. And then come April, if you have fulfilled your goal, then you get your money back. And if you don't, they keep your money. And it's a really good idea. So people are using this. Um, uh, actually, I think they've got a lot more money than this on the line now. The guys who started the site, by the way, are economists, and they're doing the smart thing and investing this money. But the point is, it's a, great, it's a really great idea to do this, because you're putting some on the line that stings uh, if you were to lose it. Um, and, and there's another, there's a related idea here which people implement in various ways, which is, uh, let's say you're trying to quit smoking. So for example, there's one woman um, who really wanted to quit smoking. She was uh, socially very liberal and had participated in a lot of the civil rights movements in the 1960s. And so she told her best friend, here's a check for $5,000, and if you catch me smoking again, I want you to donate this check to the, uh, to the KKK. And this is, what's known, this is what's known as an anti-charity. And the idea is you put money on the line where it's something that's really going to sting you if you lose it. So that what you're doing is you're, you're pitting these neural systems against one another. Because you're not just one thing. You've got all these driving things. So of course she wants a cigarette, but she has to keep in mind how much that's going to hurt if her money funds the KKK. OK, so that's known as an anti-charity. OK, that's number two. Number three is recruit social pressure. Why? Because one of the networks that I referred to has to do with these areas along the midline of your brain that really are invested in social things. So it turns out human brains, are, they've got a lot of circuitry that's involved in, in social things. Uh, so you know, your social fabric, what other people think of you, what's cool, what's lame, 
things like that. And so you want to leverage this if you're trying to do the right thing. You want to get other brains involved watching you. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things uh, coming back to stick is that um, very cleverly they have this thing where not only do you set your goal and the stakes, but you get a referee. So you get somebody, first of all, who's, you know, who's watching, who's a trustworthy person that you set up to make sure that you're doing the right thing, and you add friends for support. So lots of people are watching what you're doing and making sure that you're staying on track. That's a very, it's a, it's a very critical part of this working. You can't go it alone. And of course, um, as Alicia said, social media is a really critical part of patient engagement. So a lot of people do things like when they go on a diet, they commit that they're going to keep posting and telling everybody what's going on. You're recruiting social pressure that way in the best, in the best way because people, uh, people are watching you and they're making sure that you're staying on track. Um, a lot of people sign up for these fitness boot camps where you get you know, yelled at and embarrassed and if you, don't, if you don't show up, the whole gang jogs over to your house and does push-ups and jumping jacks on your front lawn and screams your name until you come out, right? So you damn well are going to show up at this thing. Well, why would anybody do that? Well, it's a really smart idea to do that because you're recruiting social, you're, you're recruiting the flip side, which is embarrassment, not just the praise of your peers, but embarrassment. And that helps too. So it's really critical to leverage these different sorts of networks in our brain if we want to make sure that we're making a Ulysses contract that's going to stick. Um, OK, so that was number three. Number four is involve emotion. So I told you, there are all these terrific websites with tons of information, but you know what? The networks in your brain, like the orbital frontal cortex, that have, care about emotional response, they don't care at all about those websites. They don't even understand those websites. Because those parts of your brain that are involved in the emotional experience of things just don't speak that language. They don't speak the language of all that vocabulary and this, and this is what you should do, and so on. Instead, a lot of the brain, a lot of our decision making, is steered around by emotion. So um, I'll give you an example of this. Some of you may have, may have heard this old philosopher's dilemma called the trolley dilemma, which is, so let's say you're standing over here on the side of a train track, and you notice that there are five men who are tied to the track. And there's a trolley barreling down the track, and it's out of control. The brakes are broken. And it's going to kill these five men. You can see that. But you happen to be standing, oh, sorry, you happen to notice that there's, a, uh, there's another track with only one worker on it. And you happen to be standing next to a lever. And so the, the question is, do you switch the lever so that the trolley goes down this track and kills the one person instead of the five? So how many, uh, how many would switch the lever so only one person's killed instead of five? OK, how many would not switch the lever and just stand there and let five people get killed? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Only one person. We'll, we'll talk after it. OK. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's, the, that's philosopher's dilemma, scenario number one. Scenario number two is it's the same thing. You're standing, by this, you're standing there. You see five men that are going to get killed. But this time, you're standing on a footbridge that's over the track. And there's an obese man standing in front of you. And you realize that if you push the man over the edge, his body weight will be sufficient to slow down the trolley and save these five men. So who's going to push the obese man over to his death? OK, only, only three, four people. But I want you to notice it's the same thing. I'm asking you, will you trade one life for five lives? And in the first case, everyone's happy to do it. In the second case, nobody's happy to do it. Why? Well, it has to do with these emotional centers. So what happens when you measure people in the scanner doing this task is that in the first case, it's just a math problem. And so the areas of your brain that are involved in you know, just figuring out uh, equations and so on, those come online. It's easy. The second task, you're actually touching your actual bridge, saying, hey, this is what you're going to look like if you keep eating. Or for people who are trying to quit tobacco, showing pictures like this. Or people who are trying to become vegetarians, visit a slaughterhouse, something like that. right? Because that's the language that the brain understands in those networks. And it's a powerful <laughs> political party. So if you want to make sure that you do the right thing in the future, you've got to get a hold of these guys. You have to bring them into your coalition. Okay? Um, and the flip side of punishment, by the way, is this issue of reward. You know, so companies are always trying to get their logos to trigger this reward system with like some kind of Pavlovian association by offering rewards and so on. And uh, you can do the same thing by saying, OK, well, if I go to the gym, then after the gym, I get my favorite coffee drink in my favorite restaurant or whatever. So people can set up, you can set up these sorts of things yourself where if you do this thing that was somewhere between neutral and aversive to you, you get a reward afterwards. This is a very basic but very powerful way of making sure that if you set this rule up, you'll follow this. 
And that, that, uh, and that, brings, me to the, uh, that brings me to this last point, which is establishing rules. Setting up rules in your life for habits that you follow just because in your moment of sober reflection when your Ulysses and this island of the sirens is still a long way off, the question is, what do you set up so that you don't do the wrong thing? So, you know, an example is don't ever eat dessert. Like, I'm the kind of person who never eats dessert. You set that rule up in your life, and then, and then it's easy. Then it's easy to follow it because now you're, you're battling something about, you know, this delicious thing in front of you with your notion of yourself and who you are as a person and what it means to not be the kind of person who's responsible enough to live up to your own rules. Um, people set all kinds of rules about portion control. Uh, one, one example is eating half of your portion and then throwing the other half out. I know, I know a lot of people who do this sort of rule. They eat 50% of the meal and then they throw it out. That's the rule they set up. It's a great idea. Um, every, I, I don't usually follow that rule, but sometimes when I do, sometimes when I've got a bowl of something way too big in front of me and I've eaten half it, what I do is I pick up the salt shaker and I pour salt all over the other half so that I just won't do it. Okay, so that's the Ulysses contract. And this is the kind of thing, you know, you can set up a rule where you say, you know what, I love Starbucks. I'm only going to drink Starbucks after the gym, so I can't do it any other time because that's the rule I've set for myself. Okay, so these are the kinds of things you can do. Oh, and then, you know, rules like I mentioned earlier with Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, clear all the alcohol out of your house. But you can also set up rules like don't ever buy alcohol. You're the kind of person who never even buys it. Okay, so these are the kind of things that really help when people are thinking about their resolutions, whether it's New Year's resolutions or their patient engagement resolution, whatever it is, you need to make sure that all these things are in place. Oh, and I just want to mention one more. Don't overcommit. Some of you may have heard this, uh, this short TED talk about, you know, if you want to become a vegetarian, for all these reasons why it's useful to become a vegetarian, it's hard, right? So this guy suggested, why don't you just become a weekday vegetarian? You just do it five days a week, and on the weekends, eat whatever you want. Those things are really useful in terms of establishing rules that aren't so rigid that you can't follow them, but instead it gets you most of the way there with a rule that's followable. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna wrap up the, the heart of this, which is that we have all these drives and they all wanna be in control. And that's the way to understand our decision making and why people know what the right thing is to do, but they act against their better judgment. And obviously I'm not just talking about patient uh, engagement in their healthcare, I'm talking about all of us, right? And so. You've got all these different networks. You have some that care about price point. You have some that care about emotional experience. You have some that care about social, all these things. And the right way to do this is to make sure that you structure things in a way where you're maximally leveraging everything you can so that when you set something up in advance, you'll follow through with it. Uh, the main lesson is that these neural systems are always battling it out under the surface. You typically don't have any access to what is going on in that battle. When you're standing at the grocery store and you're looking at the you know, the ice cream section and you're trying to decide which brand of ice cream and so on. There's lots of stuff happening under there, but you don't have access to what that is. But your job is to captain this ship, right? And so what I suggested is uh, five different ways, five different um, habits that you can establish to allow you to do this. So minimize temptation, risk money, put it on the line, recruit social pressure, both encouragement on social media and embarrassment. Um, make sure that emotion is involved. It can't be one of these government websites that you go to and just read all the facts about cancer prevention. It's just not going to do anything. Um, and, and establish habits. So um, the question that you know, everybody in this room and everybody online and every patient should be thinking about all the time is how do you, how do you make a social contract with yourself? What are you going to do there? OK, um, so that's all I'm going to say. And I'll take any questions now. Thanks very much. question about um, advertising and because of what you said it's really interesting that there's a commercial for um, special K which is food you know and they have a picture of a scale which is dreadful for most people who are trying to lose weight and on the screen of the scale it has words like joy and pride and so forth mm -hmm. so how is that how is that relating to a person's subconscious? I mean, it, it's really it, setting up a, a positive environment for, for them and their product. Yeah, it's very clever for the advertiser to do this. Um, and of course, 
Um, anybody could take advantage of that. I could advertise ice cream and put joy and so on around it. And of course, uh, there's a sense in which advertisers are centuries ahead of neuroscientists on all this, right? Because you put in, you leverage all these things with your brand, um, showing that your brand is associated with pretty people and joyful words and social popularity and so on. Um, that's all plugging into these reward systems. I just showed a, a quick diagram of it, but you have um, these reward systems, mostly underpinned by a particular neurotransmitter called dopamine, which associates things, which sets up associations between, wow, this thing is going to be really rewarding. So that, that particular brand is just taking advantage, like all other brands do, of saying, hey, we want to hook into people's emotions on this so that if this is their goal, it's you know, going to lose weight, bang, they'll think of us. So I just flashed by for one second, but companies always try to get their logos or their brand associated with those reward systems. Thanks for that question. Hi, uh, how can you modulate a uh, reward system for, uh, for addiction, uh, any kind of addiction, and how can you quantify that those can be useful f uh, to combat addiction? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, one of the experiments we're doing in my lab right now is right at the heart of that. So what we're trying to do is cure addiction to crack cocaine. And the numbers are that 90% of crack addicts want to quit, but they find themselves unable. Why? Because it's really hard to quit. The drug hijacks your reward systems, tells you this is the best thing that's ever happened to you. But you also have this sort of longer term decision making parts of your brain that understand the consequences it's had in your life in terms of financial loss, loss of relationships, loss of employment opportunities, right? So what's happening in a drug addict almost all the time is this battle between these systems where you want to quit but you find yourself unable. Okay. So here's the experiment we're doing. We're using what's called real-time feedback in neuroimaging, fMRI. And here's how it works. Uh, we have the uh, person who's trying to quit go into the scanner, and we show them pictures of crack cocaine and paraphernalia. And we ask them to crave. <laughs> well, this lights up their brain. This is easy. It's easy for them to get in that craving state. OK, we measure those networks in their brain that are involved in craving. Now we ask them to suppress that craving. There's a particular well-defined network of areas that are involved in suppressing. And we ask them, think about the consequence, the cost this has had to your life. OK, so now there's this battle going on. And what we do is we measure that on the fly. And, and we, sh we summarize the ratio of activity of these networks by a speedometer on the screen that goes from crave to suppress. And their job is to move the speedometer down to the suppress uh, thing. And, and, and the key is they're getting feedback for the first time in history about what's going on under the hood. In other words, it's hard to know what the heck those networks are doing. But if we can measure it and show people on the fly, give them direct visual feedback, then they know, OK, I'm going to surf through my mental space. Let me try doing this. Let me try doing that. Oh, wow, that's really working. I'm really finding a way to make that go down. Now, I call this the prefrontal gym because what we're doing is strengthening people's capacity by practicing this over and over. What do I need to do in order to suppress that craving? And the idea is when they go out in the real world and somebody offers them crack cocaine, they think, ooh, I want that, but I know what I need to do to suppress that craving. Now, we don't know if this is going to work yet. Um, we have high hopes. And if it works, it's going to be a game changer because we can go to the legal system and say, you know what, instead of Mass incarceration, you know, the prison population has increased 800% since the war on drugs began. Um, instead of throwing everybody in jail, why don't we get, have some meaningful method for, for drug rehabilitation? So thank you for that question. Um, just before uh, we take more questions, I just want to make a note that as we're having the conversation here in this room, there's actually a Twitter conversation going on. Um, if you're following on Twitter, if you have your phones and you want to follow along, it's hashtag med medx. So you can tweet along and sort of follow the conversation. So we are actually taking questions. Um, I'm not texting in front of the class. I'm actually taking questions from uh, the Twitter stream. Um, but I see that there's some other hands up. Well, all right, well, let's take a uh, Twitter question then. Actually, that's a good idea. Uh, Courage Sings right, is, is watching on the, the uh, live stream. And her question, I'm sorry. The question is, how does mental illness impact our ability to follow through? How can we overcome things like depression? So where does mental illness yeah. fall in this? Yeah, in this those are, that's a terrific question. Um, so OK, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad the asker specified about uh, depression, because there are many forms of mental illness. But as far as depression goes, 
you know, that's really a challenge. And this is one of the things that is hard for people to do when they're depressed. But getting a social network around them to do the thing of giving them support and being there to watch what's going on is one of the most critical things that people can, uh, can do to be um, on top of their own health care. Um, just as one example, many people are doing um, social network analyses now where they look at, let's say, your Facebook network and they look at it as a graph. And uh, it turns out that the, the particular flavor of your social connections is predictive of how people will fare in terms of depression, in terms of health care, in terms of things like suicide risk. And the reason is, just as one example of this growing field, um, if you have uh, 12 friends, but your friends don't know each other, then if you drop out of the network and you stop showing up on, uh, on some social media site, um, nobody's really able to start chatting with each other and figure out what's going on. But people who have high triangularity where their friends all know each other, um, as soon as they drop out, everyone starts chatting. Hey, where's, where's Alicia? How's it going? And then people come check on you. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, depression's, depression is it's a really tough nut to crack. But for people who know that that is a risk in their life, setting some of these Ulysses contracts up in advance, like making sure, hey, you know what? If I drop out, come check on me. Come see if I'm doing all right. That's a critical piece to it. Excellent. Great. Well, in terms of addiction, rationalization, it's the most, uh, the biggest enemy. Most what is? I didn't rationalization. Oh, rationalization. Yes, yes. quite right. Uh, and uh, social, you look for social uh, gathering to be all right with your rationalization instead of telling you the truth. So do you have any tricks to... Uh, avoid over-rationalization and convince yourself that this is good instead of the other one? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, the general story in addiction science is you got to hit rock bottom. So when people hit rock bottom, they have that little spark of that other political party that says, wow, you know, all of my rationalization isn't really holding up here. I've really, I'm really losing everything now. And the key in terms of this Ulysses contract, the key is then to fan those embers and really get that political party going. But the general observation has been that people often don't get there until things get really hard on them, unfortunately. Once again, it's amazing to, to learn from you. I really enjoy very much your talks. And one of the things that I like is that it makes me think so many things. So I will very quickly so make some questions and answer if you want one or none. The first one is the example of I see a beautiful woman and I see the eye that dilatado. And I say, oh, is this one that I like. That's an example for many people that you're really, you don't have a free will. <laughs> you're actually not choosing. There is something and you cannot work on it. Sam Harris, as you know, has written a lot about that. Question number two, very quickly. In some examples like the marshmallow, we could start believing that you were born like that. The rate of discount of the future is a big issue in life. How much do you appreciate that you will live or not? For mm -hmm. criminals and people that you know that they don't have money, they don't see they have future, they live in poverty, the discount rate is very high and this contextual is the culture. But with a marshmallow example, they are kids. So probably you could begin believing, well, you know, this discount rate, it has to do much more with your genes than with your context. My question here will be, well, do, am I born like that with that discount rate? Or, and even I do this Ulysses contract, I mean, it's like that, and I was born like that, or actually it's much more like what we have seen with crime and poverty, that it's much more my context that I want value the future. The answer, oh. And a very, very, very okay. quickly comment. Eh? Just be careful, this famous example about the train that everybody uses, if you will say five or die or one or whatever, we have to take into consideration that to push a person that is very fat and it's stronger than you, probably first he won't die, second probably he will hit you again. Probably, I mean, we never take into consideration that in an example. That's and, fine. And, <laughs> the, and, the, and the last point, very, very quickly. <laughs> you start saying that we are not homo economicos, yeah. no? At the end, all these four things are cost-benefit analysis. Increase social pressure, cost. 
increase, uh, put money on the line, cost. Take into concentration your emotions, cost. It's a cost-benefit analysis at the end. That, I'm sorry. Social okay, pressure. let me just, let me, <laughs> let me uh, super quickly answer these in, in reverse order, which is the issue about the homo economicus is that <clears throat> it's not that we're not that, it's that parts of our brain are that. So you have parts of your brain that are extremely rational. They do math problems well. They do uh, uh, <clears throat> cost-benefit analyses. And what you want to do is give more power to those in some situations than the other parts of your brain that are involved in I want it right now. So you, yes, so that's the key is you're tipping the balance. It's not that you don't have those parts. Um, as far as the issue about pushing the man off the bridge, there are 50 things that you can envision about what that's involved in. But the key finding is that that turns on the emotional areas of the brain, that turns on the hot systems in the brain that then change your decision making. For what your reasons might be different than other people's reasons, but nonetheless, that's the facts on the ground is that these emotional areas, the limbic system comes online when you have to interact with somebody at that distance. Um, coming back to the issue of nature versus nurture, the answer always is both. And um, you know, you're born with a certain set of genes, you drop into a particular family of origin and a particular culture. As a result, brains go off on very different trajectories from day one as a result of the confluence of those. And um, you know, if you look around a room and see the difference in people's faces, there's that much difference in people's brains on the inside. People are really, really different. It has to do with these trajectories. And it's a, it's a big feedback loop because your genes and your environment intertwine to make you who you are right now. Then you find yourself in some situation. Those combine to do your action. And whatever action you did is what feeds back on your experiences in life. Um, so the answer to that is, is both. Uh, the free will question is one of my favorite, but I'm not going to, there's just no way I'm going to be able to answer that adequately in, in 30 seconds. Okay, it did, um, just a quick note. We are going to run a little bit over uh, tonight, probably about 10 minutes, because there is quite a bit of interest in this topic. So thank you very much for that. Um, is there another question in the room? If not, we'll take one from Twitter. I've noticed uh, there, there have been like calls for people to be in studies and so on, and, and also testing for ADHD and things like that with these brain scans. And I, I wonder, I mean, isn't that so like, I don't, I don't know about the technology, but it seems like it would harm your brain if they're going, taking pictures of things. Thank you for that question. It yeah. doesn't harm your brain. It's a magnetic field, mm -hmm. and it's harmless. And people have been doing this for over two decades now. And they've done long-term studies on uh, animals first and then humans and so on. It's totally harmless to be in a magnetic field. Thank, thank you for that question, though. It's just radio waves and magnetic field. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a um, question from Twitter. And uh, this is from Carly RM. I hope I'm saying that right. Carly RM. Um, how can we have healthcare practitioners fill the role of checking in? on people in case they lack a personal support system. So how can this is, this, is, this is the promise of social media, right? So I think okay. everybody's trying to, to move things in this direction, but um, it's, it's pretty easy to make an app for that. And I think lots of companies, insurance companies, healthcare systems are working now on thinking about ways to do that. So in the same way that the uh, you know, woman posted her diet plan or this or that to um, to her friends on Facebook, uh, there are several different pathways by which healthcare providers are trying to solve that, where essentially uh, the doctor knows which screenings you've had, what's going on. Obviously, it can be done with, with uh, you know, automated analytics so that the doctor doesn't have to actually log in and check every day, but just gets a flag when somebody you know, has not shown up for a visit, is not followed up, and so on. One of the biggest challenges in the medical system is, is patient compliance, just getting people to do the right thing. And so as we increasingly move towards a society where all the records are merged and where people are quantified in various sorts of ways, it just becomes easier and easier for healthcare providers to check in in that way. That's, a, that's pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. just wrote that word before you mentioned it, compliance. I'm a physical therapist, and I am totally dedicated to scoliosis. I do have scoliosis myself, and I feel totally straight, but I'm not straight. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last. In other words, I, I, I have scoliosis. Yes. Mm -hmm. In my brain, I feel totally straight. Oh. But I, ha but I have a crooked body. Mm. So where is the neuroproprioception gets into this? Why it didn't give me a warning? 
that was If very, I understood your question correctly, you're saying you have scoliosis, but correct. you feel like you're, you're standing straight. Co no, constantly. I, I feel straight. You cannot tell me that I'm not straight. Okay. There was an issue. Oh. This is, okay, thank you for that question. It's a complicated one. The way that people view their own bodies is an extreme. Everyone who's ever looked in the mirror and thought, wow, I'm especially fat today or especially skinny today, even though you haven't changed at all, it, this, is a, this is an area that's very complicated. I don't know the, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to why people have um, internal models of their own body that don't actually match very well with what their bodies look like. Uh, it may be because it's gradual. Mm -hmm. I don't know the I don't know the answer to why your brain didn't send the warning. Yeah. All right, we're going to take another question from uh, the Twitter stream. This is from Cascadia. Uh, her question is: As we move toward patient-centered care, what behavioral levers can we use to change provider behavior in that uh, the patient-centered care? So there's been a lot of discussion. I'm in just medical asking centers. the questions from that. The question is, what can you do to change provider behavior rather than just patient engagement? I think this is very related to the issue we brought up a minute ago, um, which is uh, there have been a lot of medical uh, centers and systems that have been toying with this issue about um, how do you reward doctors based on outcome. Um, there are sort of obvious pros to that. Some of the cons to that um, have to do with uh, physicians running every, you know, a bajillion tests, which already happens now, but it even it makes the problem even a little bit worse in terms of the amount of expenditure in the healthcare system. Because if your salary is predicated by making sure that your patients come out well, then you're just going to blow a ton of money to make sure that happens. So that's the downside of it. But there, there are several um, systems that are playing with that idea now. Very good, excellent. Uh, I just want to take a minute and just say we've we've still got a lot of uh, conversation going on in the Twitter stream, we're actually seeing people from all over the world joining us, so we're getting some excellent uh, feedback. And I'd like to um, just take a moment and say that Christopher Snyder, who's sitting in the back of the room, he's I am Spartacus on Twitter, has been helping moderate the uh, Twitter stream and keeping the, the questions and the conversation going there. So this is very, a truly dynamic um, event tonight, so it's excellent. Any more questions in the room? Go ahead, sir. You know, going off of your provider um, scenario, you know, say a provider uh, supplies a care plan to a patient, and the patient, you know, sets up a contract for the stick portion, but also is aiming at the rewards. Are there any studies to show the frequency um, and the type of reward and the effect it has on the brain uh, in order to turn itself into an addiction? So a positive addiction. A positive addiction. Yeah, there, there are studies on this. The bottom line is the best kind of reward is unpredictable reward. And so um, if you know that you're going to keep getting something every once a week, you'll get a little cookie from your physician. I don't mean a literal cookie. I mean, you'll get some little reward from your physician. That's not as, as interesting to you as if there's something that where it comes at unpredictable times. And the, the, that's shown all the way down to the level of the electrophysiology of the dopamine system. Any more questions in the room? Will this, will this be just, just a second? Will this lecture be available uh, after it's over? We find it online. Yes, it will be archived at um, aim.stanford.edu forward slash engage for the remainder of the semester or the quarter. Have they done any studies about hypnotherapy and whether that really does work? Uh, the question about hypnotherapy or hypnosis, uh, you know, I don't know. It's really on the fringe of neuroscience. It's not sort of squarely in the middle of what neuroscience is doing. Whether that means there's nothing to it, I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's an area that's uh, it's, it's not really at the center of what's going on. Thanks. I'm a little bit more curious about your research in your lab. Do you have a particular study or field that you are most excited about right now? Thanks for that question. I, in my lab, uh, mostly what I study is how brains construct reality. And decision making is sort of a subset of that. But I also study things like the perception of time and something called synesthesia. And um, when it comes to neuro law, which is uh, one of the main areas I study, that has a lot to do with how reality is different in different people's heads. And it has to do with 
their genes and environment and everything that makes them a particular kind of person and the culture they're embedded in and so on, and how their decision making can be different just based on, uh, because essentially we, whatever your brain serves up to you, you believe is true. I mean, you just, that is truth, right? If you think that this person just insulted you or disrespected you or this or whatever it is that your brain is telling you or that this cocaine is going to be the best thing for you next, uh, you believe it. So that's my general interest in neuroscience is how do brains construct that reality and convince us so, so deeply about it. All right, we're going to take um, one more question from Twitter. Uh, this question is from Jolene Chambers. Uh, when patient outcome information is proprietary or obscured, how... Essentially, how can patients make good decisions? Um, <clears throat> when, when what kind of information is obscured? About, about their own medical records? Is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm asking you. It, yeah. We don't know. But, but okay, so if the, asker means, <laughs> if the asker means about their own medical I happen to be, uh, just philosophically, very much in favor of patients always having access right. to all their medical records. And it should be easy for them to access that. They shouldn't have to call every hospital and try to get it in this difficult way. So. Um, Hopefully, that will be the direction of the future so that patients have that. Now, there's a deeper question there, which is do patients always understand what they're looking at? And right. often the answer is no. Um, and sometimes people can misinterpret and overreact to various sorts of things. So um, uh, be that as it may, um, there, it, it, it may be an issue right now for people who don't have enough access to some critical piece they know. But the general story is we all generally know what's good for us and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and, you know, our better judgment tells us uh, what to do next. And that's the kind of thing I'm addressing is the things that people can really do themselves in terms of patient compliance and so on. And for that, you only need your own data on, on your own behavior. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate thank you so much it. for your attention. Yep. yep. Um, I just, I'm just going to take a minute to just uh, finalize, uh, say a couple last words here. Um, again, thank you very much for all the questions on the live stream uh, and the conversation that we were having um, so online. Uh, I always like that. And I learned a great deal from, from you tonight, so I really appreciate um, hearing what you had to say. Um, thank you, Dr. Chu, again, for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, it's an honor to be here and talk with everybody in the class. But um, I just uh, uh, I want to just remind everybody that the class for next week, February 6th. Uh, the guest lecturers will be Susanna Fox from the uh, Pew Internet and American Life Project. Um, she's in DC. She's going to speak on the topic of participatory research um, and what we can learn. Um, can we learn more when we listen as opposed to speaking? Um, and Brett Adler will be here. Alder will be here next week. He's another e-patient scholar like um, myself, um, and he's going to be essentially sharing his e-patient story with you next week as well. So again, thank you very much for attending tonight's class. If you have any questions, uh, tweet me <laughs> for those of you following along at home, or um, feel free to see us at the end of the class. Thank you again. <laughs>